come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow uh, of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house silvers, uh, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. If you will, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the wonderful sunshine, Lord, and we thank you for those here gathered uh, to hear your word and to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, that you'd give them something. If they don't get something this morning, Lord, it would be my fault, uh, uh, and, and I pray that I wouldn't be in the way, that you would be uplifted, honored, and glorified, and your word would have preeminence in all things. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Does anybody need a pen? I have a pen here if anybody needs one uh, for the fill-out. If you do need a pen, it's right up here if you want to grab it. But um, I do. I like to do a little fill-out sheet um, for the Bible study. Um, you don't have to do it, but uh, I find it's a little easier to follow along. And um, we're going to get into the Bible study this morning. If you have any questions, the Bible study is a little more laid back than the preaching message, where you can ask questions. You can, uh, uh, If you have any questions of what's being taught, what's being said of the Scriptures. We're getting into the Bible study this morning, and in the Bible study, we, we picked it up last week where we found out the name of God. Uh, we, we, we saw God's name revealed from Old Testament to New Testament. His name is I Am that I Am. I am Jehovah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that's the name of our God. Uh, you know something, when I got to know my wife, or when you get to know somebody, uh, you at least have to know their name. I mean, that sounds so elementary, it sounds so basic, yet so many people, so many Christians say they know God, they know of Him, they, they know about Him, and they know Him personally, yet they don't know His name. They don't know who to call upon. And that's just a sad thing, because uh, uh, if you say you know somebody, you, you at least got to know their name, let alone the deeper things, what they like, what they dislike, you know. And uh, God wants you to know Him personally. He wants you to. He wants to get to know you. If you, he already knows you, but he wants you to know him, and you got to know who he is. You have to know who to call upon. And Jehovah is the name of the Great I Am. And in the New Testament, Jehovah's salvation is Jesus, Jesus Christ. And of course, the question is, do you know him? Do you know him not as only God, but do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? And is he the Lord of your life? And uh, that's the most important. And uh, like I said last week, his name is revealed bit by bit through the scriptures. Uh, there were people that didn't know him by his full name until later on. And of course, we have the scriptures and we can retrospect. We can look back and see what has been revealed. And uh, God's name wasn't always fully revealed throughout the scriptures. But he reveals it to us in his name. And, of course, into the Greek and the Hebrew, you get uh, Yahweh and, and the Tetragrammaton, and, and, and you get Jehoshua, Yeshua, uh, and uh, El, El Shaddai, El Elohim. But we know what it's translated. It's Jehovah. It's Jesus. Jesus Christ. You know, God just has a way to make things so simple for us. If we want to make that which is simple complicated, he makes that which is complicated simple. And that's... And that's what's needed. The, uh, you know something is, Jesus says to the disciples, you want, he says, come unto me as a child. You say, how does a child come? Humbly. Basic. And uh, God makes it basic for us. He doesn't say you have to know all the names. He just says you need to know Jesus. You call on Jesus Christ. And uh, you know something is, as we go along here, they claim to know Christ, and, and you ask a particular, like a Muslim, who claims to know God, who claims that they know uh, uh, their God to be the same as our God, and they don't know his name. I've, I've had the privilege of witnessing to a Muslim, and uh, their God has no name. Their God doesn't have the name Jehovah, the name uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Their God is a nameless God who goes by the ascribed title of Allah. And, uh, you know, they try to make it common ground. A person stated all they're trying to do is share common ground. Well, all they're trying to do is make your God the same as their God, our God the same as the, the, the Muslim God. 
Don't you just want, and here's, the, and here's the thing that we get pressure. Don't you just want to ecumenically get along? Can't you just accept that their God, which has no name, is be the same as our God? And the answer is simply no. And if they won't accept the truth of God, then they can't reject, they can't accept the true God. Especially, uh, and, and like I said, when I've witnessed, their God is not the same as our God. For one thing, their God doesn't, they don't believe that God had a son, or God needed a son, or God sent his son into this world, which shows you evidence that their God is not the same God as ours as they try to state. You can't, be de you can't be deceived, Christian. You know, if something is the same, then there's an agreement. If we serve the same God, then we come to an agreement on who he is and what he is, which shows you that there isn't a same God. And you need to realize that. You don't serve uh, a false God, and you don't serve the many gods that others may serve. When you serve the God of the Bible, he has a name. He is a specific God, and he's singled out from all the rest. He is not ecumenical. And the big push today is ecumenicism. And you've got, you've got religious leaders joining up with other religious leaders. I'm talking about Christian and Muslim and all that, claiming that the God is the same God. Now, if they want to come over to the true and living God, there's nothing wrong with that. But we're not going to make our God to be a false God to make it palatable for others. Amen. And that's the truth. We cannot do that because God would not do that. God says, I am not of those. I'm not those ways. I'm not those gods. So we'll get right into the Bible study this morning. And as we're coming down here, number one, in Exodus chapter 3, verses uh, 14 through 22. And let's pick it up in verse 14, uh, 15. Sorry. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And so number one, if, you, uh, if you're going to serve God, you're going to serve the true God. And that's number one. You're going to serve the true God in order to bring his message. You know, the Bible says this, I didn't write it down, but Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. When you get an ecumenical God that wants to cover up a name to try to blend in other gods, that's not a true God. That is not the living God. Our God has no no bashfulness about himself to declare who he truly is and to separate him from any false god, named or nameless. You know, I'll say it this way. If you're lost in the woods and you're using a compass, you know there's 359 directions that are going to lead you the wrong way. There's only one direction that's going to get you the right way. You know something? There are many gods in this world. And, of course, in America, our gods are just a little different. Our gods in America are things like, oh, I don't know, sports, uh, ourselves, television, idols. They even have a show out there called American Idol. How about that? Uh, stars, Hollywood stars. Those are American idols. Uh, uh, just because our idols aren't graven images, folks, doesn't mean that there aren't many idols in America. And those idols are, are false gods, and they're all wrong. You know what the big idol in America is today? Ourselves. We're very, uh, I've gone to different countries. I've been to India, I've been to Guatemala, I've been to others. One thing that people will notice about our culture versus other cultures in different countries, we're a very individualistic culture. Only in America does somebody revel in having their own opinion just because it's their own. It could be wrong opinion. It could be a very wrong opinion, but... Well, I have my own opinion, darn it. And that's our culture. Our culture, we worship ourselves. You know, you go to India, you go to these other countries, they worship graven images, and they actually have statues and idols. And so because we don't, we think we're, we're that much better off, but our idols are inside of us. They're idols of the heart. And our idols are ourselves. 
We think that we're God. Well, of course, we wouldn't say that out loud. But boy, we think it sometimes. Look at the debates and look at the division in America, politically and just uh, individual. We're individualistic because we're worshiping ourselves. If you're lost in the woods, there's 359 wrong directions to go that are going to lead you further away. And there's only one direction. You know what Jesus says? He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Many false gods, many false religions, many false teachings. There's more now than there ever was before. I don't even blame people for that aren't saved. There's so many lies that the devil has placed in front of people, cults and false religions, that it's sometimes it, it, there's a lot of blindness between ourselves and the, and the true and living God and the true and living way. But it is through Jesus Christ, and it's only through him, not any... Uh, he doesn't share his God. He, he, he has a Godhead. He doesn't share his power with any other God. I'll put it that way. There's only one direction to go. And there's only one God we serve. There's only one book we have. There's only one way. You know what it says in the New Testament? There's one baptism wherein we are baptized. There's one hope, one faith, one spirit, one God. That's the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, number two says this, God makes things happen. Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. Go, and this is God speaking to Moses, and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. So what God tells him to do is God tells Moses to go back to Israel because at this point, Moses is in the desert. He's in the wilderness. God tells him to go back and go to the elders. And look at verse 18, what the elders will do. And they, these are the elders of Israel, shall hearken to thy voice. Um, number two says this, God makes things happen in his time. That's number two. God makes things happen in his time. Now, you remember Moses how he got into the wilderness to begin with, he killed that Egyptian, thinking to do God's service, thinking to do God's work. Pharaoh hated him for it, was ready to kill him, so Moses went into the wilderness. Now he's confronted by God. Now he's going to go back. He's going to talk to the elders. The elders are going to listen to him because it's in God's time and God's way. You know... And I'll, I'll put it to you this way. You need to, you ever do something, you try to do something good that's out of time? Perhaps had Moses gone to the elders 40 years earlier, they probably wouldn't have listened to him. You say, why? Because it wasn't God's time yet. And like I said, you try to do something, a good thing out of, out of time, it, it backfires, it doesn't work. It's like, it's like, the elephant in the room, as good as a thing may be. And I dare say we're Christians here this morning. We try to do good for God. We don't try to do evil. But just doing a good thing, if it's at the wrong time, isn't going to bring about the right thing. I'd love to do all sorts of ministries with this church right now, but I know I'd break your backs. I know it wouldn't, why. It wouldn't be the right time. Doing a bunch of ministry, that's a good thing. Helping people. Winning people to the Lord, doing things like that. But there's a time for things. And if you do the right thing at the wrong time, it's still the wrong thing. You don't hear that a lot in preaching today. You don't hear that across the pulpits. You don't hear that in uh, churches. Go to Ecclesiastes. I'll clarify what I'm saying. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 6. We think because we work hard and we have the right motive that that's, that's it. And to a degree that is true, but I'm going to show you that timing is everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 6 says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. Now we're not talking right or wrong, good or evil. We're talking just doing good, 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 doing what we think God would have us to do. 
Let me give you an illustration. We live in New York. This is the winter time. You go and dig the ground and you, I mean, you toil at that ground and you dig it and you dig it and you, and you get that hole and, and you turn over the dirt and you put seed in it. Man, you're working hard. You're, you're, you're sweating. And then you put seed in that thing. And you're like, all right, there we go. That seed will not grow. It'll die. It will, you, will, you will get no harvest. If you get anything, it'll be a little. Say why? Because you did the wrong, you, you, you worked so hard, you did it the, what, what you think God would have you to do, but you did it in the wintertime. You're supposed to put that seed in the spring. You say, what are you getting at? You got to do the right thing, but you got to do it at the right time. It's about time and judgment. You know why people are miserable? You know why people have no joy? And I'm talking Christian. I'm talking Christians that are live, love God. Christians that try to serve God because they try to do the right thing at the wrong time. And it's out of place. And Moses tried to do that. But now God's behind it. You say, what's the difference between Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, and Moses way back when he was uh, fleeing from Pharaoh? The difference is God. The difference is, we're going to read it later on, Moses listens to his father-in-law's advice about setting people over Israel, and, and it's great logical advice. You say, what's the problem? God wasn't in it. It wasn't on God's time. i, I, I got to say this. As a pastor, as an associate pastor, people come to me with great suggestions. And, and, and logically speaking, they're great suggestions. They're great to follow. You say, what's, what, what's got to be? It's got to be done in God's timing. Not, not your timing or my timing. And, and you'll know when God's timing is because things will just start to move and work. And, and it's not something that you always you know, can see right away. And you've got to have that discernment. And, and it comes with growth in Scripture. It comes with growth in, in time as a Christian. Go to Ecclesiastes 3.1. You know, people say that... Um, Solomon was backslidden when he wrote Ecclesiastes, but this is given by inspiration, and, and the Holy Spirit's never backslidden. <laughs> uh, amen. And, and what Ecclesiastes shows us is life on this earth, under the sun. And it says this, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I'm going to say it again. You may work hard, but if you put that seed in the ground at the wrong time, God will not bless it even though you may have had a good heart about it or a good attitude, or maybe even if you put a lot of work into it. you got to put the seed in at the right time to get the harvest. And Moses is going to get blessed here because he's going to do what God would him to do at God's timing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says this, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. All in God's timing. And like I said, it isn't because that what we do is wicked or wrong. I'm talking about good things. You know, we want to do this and we want to do that. And it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. We just got to do it at the right time. We got to do things in God's timing. You would go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse, or excuse me, Exodus 3, 17. Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. So number, number 2 says, God, make things, God makes things happen in his time. And when God told him that he goes to those elders, those elders will listen to him. Those elders will do what needs to be done because God is behind it, because God has commanded it, because God will, it is in his time. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 17, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So here we see that God is speaking. He's speaking again to Moses. And in verse uh, 17, it says, And I said, I will bring you up. For number 4, you see here, um, 
What I want you to focus on before we get to number four is the first part of that verse. And I have said, you know something you can have confidence in? You can have confidence in not what I say, not what people say. You can have confidence in what God said. You know how I know I'm saved? It's not because of anything I am or I do. I have confidence that if I were to die right now and go to heaven, because it's God said it in his word. You know why I'm so big on the King James Bible as the final authority? Because I know I have in my hands what God said. And I know I can put stock in what God said. I know that what God said will come to pass. I know people let you down. Oh, my goodness. Nowadays, people say one thing and do another. I, I, uh, I'm dealing with my car right now. And I told them because they extended my time, my car is in the shop because I hit a deer. And uh, they just told me, they told me that it would be done by January 30th. It wasn't done by January 30th. They told me it would be done by February 8th. It's not done. Now they're extending it to 22nd. You say, what's your point? The point is that you can't put stock in what man says. Man, man's wrong. Man will change his mind. He'll change what he says. But when God says something, you know that he'll do it. You can put stock in what God says. And, and he says to Moses, he says, I said I'll bring you up. You say, what's going to happen? He's going to bring them up. He's going to bring them up out of Egypt because he said he would. The problem is, is people want me to take their word as if God, it's God's. Now, the same people, I'm not going to say who it is, but they said, I told them, I said, all right, my insurance only covers $900 of my uh, rental car, right? And uh, so my insurance has already paid all the $900. I've already spent all the $900. It's been a long time. Now, the difference would be under me or this shop. And, of course, the shop said that they would cover me. But I want it in writing. You say, why? Because I don't trust man. I don't trust man's word. But you know what I do trust? If it's in this Bible, and thus saith the Lord, I trust that. You say, why? Because God's never let me down. God's never backed out of his word. God's never um, lied. He never will lie. He'll never back out of it. See, the problem that people have is they think that God is like us. They think that God's like them. And because we lie to people and because we, you know, sometimes we don't even lie because we want to. We give our word too rashly. And then, oh, we can't deliver. And then we don't deliver. And we think God is that way, immoral, unjust, fickle. No, God isn't. When God declares something, it will be. And we just don't get that through our heads because we look through the lens of our flesh and our fleshly eyes. But God has declared and God declares certain things, Christian, that you want to harp on. Your salvation, that you can be saved and not die and go to hell. That he can keep you saved. Oh my goodness, folks, I'm not staying saved because of me. Because of you. I'm staying saved because of God and his word and what he said about it. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He says that you're in, the, in Christ's hands and Christ's hands is in the Father's hands. Look, if I could have lost my salvation, I would have lost it already. And then I would never have gotten it back. You say, what is it? God's word. You, and you say, I don't know what you're talking about. You read and study God's word. You'll understand. It, it, you can be born again. And you can stay saved. Maybe you're out of fellowship with God. You can get back in fellowship with God. You can do that. People that are saved that are out of fellowship, it's like, well, I'll, I can never get back in fellowship with God. I've done so many bad things. Repent of it, get right. You can get back in fellowship with God. The only one stopping you is you. What God says will come to pass. Look in Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25. This isn't George Joshua Birkinshaw. This isn't pastor. This isn't anybody. This is God Almighty speaking directly to you. He says, for I am the Lord. I will speak. And the word that I, will, uh, that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and will perform it, saith the Lord God. Do you have confidence in God that he would keep his word? God says that to Moses, I'm bringing up the nation of Israel. You know what we do? Well, God, I don't know if I don't feel saved. It doesn't matter if you feel saved. I don't feel, uh, you know, people say, well, I don't... It, they go by their feelings. I feel 
this and I feel that. It doesn't matter what we feel. We say this, well, I believe it, God said it, that settles it. Well, God said it, that settles it whether you or I believe it or not. That's, that's the truth of it all. That's the truth of it all. God wants you to believe him because he simply said it. And that takes faith. It takes faith in action. It takes exercised faith. And the problem that humans get is they, they put their faith in people. And then they put their faith in some person. That person lets them down. And then they think God is going to be that way. And God isn't that way. He'll never let you down. He is perfect. Look, I'm, I've been saved for 20 years. People have let me down. I have let myself down. But God has never let me down. Not once. Number four, God wants your well-being. God wants your well-being. Look at Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. In, over this pulpit, you've heard a lot of preaching over the years about the wrath of God and about the holiness of God and about the judgment of God. But uh, you know something is God's looking out for our well-being. He wants the best for us. Look at Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 27. The Lord bless thee and, the Lord, uh, and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. God is, is a God of holiness and balance and righteousness, but he's benevolent. He's good, he has good will. You know, when Jesus was coming to the earth, the angel said, Peace on earth, good will toward men. God does not look to... God has no malice towards us. Now, the devil, he has a lot of malice. Malice is evil intent, ill will, wanting to harm. And God does not have that toward us. And you should never think that. That's not the biblical God. That's not the God of the Bible. He is a God of goodwill. He wants to give goodwill. You say, why isn't goodwill in this earth? Because you're dealing with the devil. Because you're dealing with the flesh. Humans are evil people sometimes. And you're dealing with the world. And yeah, you look at this world and babies die and, and good people uh, die or bad things happen to good people. That's just the way of the world. That's the way of this wicked fallen. You've you got to realize that we're in a fallen uh, creation, folks. Sin is in dominion right now, and, and the devil's got a little reign right now. Now, God is over the devil, but God has let him do his little thing right now, and uh, God's going to make it right. But number four, God wants your well-being. Look at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. You've got to remember this, Christian. Look at what Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of destruction. Thoughts of ill will. Thoughts of getting even or thoughts of... No, 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 no. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you... And expect it on. Now, he's talking primarily to the nation of Israel here. And, and, and with Moses, he's talking about the nation of Israel, bringing them up out of the land of Egypt. But he, uh, this morning's message after this will kind of clarify that about grace. He wants the best for you. And I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I'm not preaching a, a Joel Steen. I'm, I'm not. I'm preaching that God is a benevolent God. And a lot of times when we go through things, we blame God for stuff that it's not him. It's, it, it's the side effects of the world. And not only that, it might be for your good in a later way to put you through something that uh, will make you sh a stronger Christian or uh, build you up in character. Uh, maybe he's judging you for something. Who knows? We don't know. We really don't. But God wants your well-being. He, he's going to deliver the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, out of uh, uh, toil. Now, just because God doesn't 
rescue you when you think he should doesn't mean that he still doesn't want the good for you. You may have to go through something. You may have made a wrong choice. <laughs> and, and now you have to learn the error of your ways through patience. Or at Exodus chapter 3, verse 18, And they shall hearken to, the, to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Number five, this one's a little different, but God is a good negotiator. We never think of God being that way, but he's a good negotiator. You know, when, when God talks to Moses and tells Moses to go unto Pharaoh, he doesn't tell Moses to go and, and demand. Hey, let's go. You know, he doesn't do that. Look at the wording he says here. He says, uh, you're going to go to the king of Egypt. You shall say to him, the Lord of the Hebrews have met with us. Let us go. We beseech thee. Be we beseech thee means like we beg of thee. We, we, in a petition. You know, you don't want to start with demands. Start with petitions before you get into the demands. Let us go and beseech you three days' journey. Um, God negotiates. Instead of saying, let's go to a three days' journey from Egypt is right about where Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai are. That's a pretty far away. But when you say a three days' journey, it sounds shorter. It doesn't sound the same. Negotiating. You know, God doesn't, when you put God as your authority and your Lord, he, he takes you as far as you can go each step of the way. He doesn't take you so far that you fall out of the way. He, he brings you just where you can go. And then he'll, re, then he'll revitalize you. And then he'll bring you a little further. He'll revitalize you. Then he'll bring you a little further. God is not a taskmaster. God is not some ogre lording over us, putting the whip to us and, and dragging us more than we can bear. Matter of fact, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you. Yoke is what they use to work with. He says, It's not heavy. He says, It's light. He says, Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, folks, I've been serving the Lord, and I see what the world puts on people and what the Lord put upon my yoke. He's given me an easy yoke. Now, I'm not saying that it's not a work. The Lord didn't say that he's not going to have us not work. He just says that the work we're going to do is going to be a light load. Say, why? Because God is not a taskmaster. He does not look to lord down upon you. He does not look to, to uh, 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 enslave you. That's what the world wants. The world and the ways of the world, now they don't want to entice you, but then they oppress you. God is not, that's the word, he's not oppressive. I've never known the Lord to be an oppressive Lord. I've never known God to be an oppressor. Oppression comes from the devil. Oppression comes from the wicked one. Oppression comes from the world and the ways of the world, not from God. He gives us a light load. You know, when I gave up some things for the Lord, uh, the Lord has given me a new work. I used to be a, a, a coach, and I loved it, but it was a lot of work. And now he's given me the, uh, uh, the ministry, and, and it's been a great work. And it's always a work. Christians, the, the Christian life is always a work. God's not going to promote laziness. He's just going to give you a load that you can bear. God is a reasonable God. You know, he's going before Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a high king. You don't go to a king and start demanding it. You know, we as Americans, we're spoiled because we live in a democracy and we, we have representation. We don't live under an a absolute monarch, or at least we shouldn't. Our monarch should be the Constitution. So we kind of have, we've been, we grew up in rights and having rights. But Pharaoh was the king of Egypt and he was like as unto a god. And people went before him. If he didn't like them, he cut their heads off. And they were at his mercy. 
And God knew that. And God knew that you just don't go to a ruler demanding things. You imagine going up to the, our president saying, do this. He's going to look at you like, what? Who are you? You know, or going to anybody that's uh, in a, any authority, do this. It's like, you don't go up to people that way. And God shows you that. When you go, you go and petition. And he says, uh, I beseech thee. He begs of thee. Look at this. The Lord God of Hebrews met with us and let us go. We beseech thee. You know, you go further with people when you petition with them. You know, my dad taught me that. When you're with an authority, re reason with them. Say, why? Because they have the authority. But when you go to an authority and petition, it usually breaks down any walls or barriers and it makes it more positive. Look, as an associate pastor, somebody were to come to me and be like, you got to do it this way. I'm going to be like, what? Who are you? And you say, well, it's just a natural tendency of our natures. And God says to Moses, you go to Pharaoh, you don't go and demand. <laughs> you might have a short life. <laughs> you might have a short body, too. Amen? He says, you go and petition. We beseech you. We beg of thee. And, and, and a three days journey. He doesn't say that we're going to bring the nation of Israel right to Mount Horeb. He doesn't say that we're going to bring them to Mount Sinai. Three days' journey is about right to there. He says it's a three days' journey. And God shows you how to deal with people, especially how to deal with people that are wrong with God. You start with a petition before you start to get a little more demanding. A three days' journey could have easily brought Israel to Mount Horeb or Sinai, but that sounds a bit much. A three days' journey sounds more mere simple. And more innocent or easier to negotiate with. God is a negotiator. I've, I've brought the message, the reasonable God, uh, a couple years ago. Our God is a reasonable God. Look at this, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Lord's reasonable. He's a reasonable God. He wants to reason with us. But watch. Say, what's his reasoning? Though your sins be as scarlet. Right about there, everybody's got their ear. Oh, God's reasonable? Yeah, and then he says, though your sins be as scarlet. You know, when you go to God to reason, you've got to go to God with a mindset that you're wrong, he's right. Listen, listen, listen. I've had times with God where I've had disagreements. No, the associate pastor had disagreements with God? Yeah. And I went to God and I said, God, I don't think you should do it that way. No, the associate pastor did that? Yeah. There's times in my life where I thought God should do it a different way than I thought. I think that he should do it. But then I always end with this, and you should always end with this. Well, God, you're right, and I'm wrong. you got to remember. You know, it's a good thing to know who's always going to be right in the situation. I don't have to doubt whether God's wrong sometimes. You know, I can be right sometimes, and I can be wrong sometimes. We all can be, right? I'm glad that I have confidence in my God, who is greater than me, who is always right. It's a great comfort knowing that. That when I go to him and I disagree, I'm wrong. He's right. And if you know that, it's going to help you much better in your relationship to God. He says, let's reason together, though your sins be as scarlet. You say, right about now, God's reason is not as reasonable to us. You know why? Because we're unreasonable. We are the unreasonable ones. He says, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be watched white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. God wants you to come on his terms, and he will help you because his terms are right. You ever have a little child try to uh, bring, bring you on their terms, and they're wrong? It's kind of cute, <laughs> but it's wrong. That's how we are with God. We're the little child with a little tyrant rage, and we think God should do it our way. And God says, mm -mm. come, you're coming on my terms. You're in sin. I can cleanse it. Amen. God knows what he's doing. For sake of time, Genesis 18, 22 through 33, I don't have time to read it, but if you, have, you want to write this down, this passage of scripture is the passage where uh, the Lord reasons with Abraham. He said, what are you talking about? Well, Abraham's nephew Lot is in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah is overtaken with wickedness. And God came down to, Mo to Abraham and Sarah. And then he says, I'm going to go to Sodom. I'm going to see what's becoming of that city. 
And he's getting ready to judge the city. He's getting ready to torch the place. Now, Abraham isn't stupid, and Abraham knows that his relative Lot is in that city. So what does he do? He reasons with God. He says, Lord, aren't thou judge? I love how he puts a, he doesn't demand of God. He asks a question. He says, aren't thou the judge of all the earth and shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <laughs> now, if I was God, I'd probably be a little peeved. But God isn't that way. God is not, you know what God isn't? He's not easily offended. I mean, he's God. Of course, he's the judge of all the earth and he would do right. But Abraham asks that. And he says, you wouldn't destroy the city for 45 righteous people, would you? And God says, I won't destroy it for 45. He says, oh, I've, I've found grace in thy sight. Uh, he, you've heard me. How about for 40? And God says, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for 40 righteous people. Then he goes right down to 10. You say, what's Abraham? He's a good negotiator. 10 righteous people. You say, why? Abraham thinks that perhaps Abraham Lot's family is righteous. And that would be enough of 10 righteous people to save that city. Now you know the story. God didn't find 10 righteous people. It was pretty much just Lot. And even with Lot's wife and children, Lot's wife turned behind and turned into a pillar of salt. You say, what did God do? He torched the city. He didn't keep his word for ten righteous people. There weren't ten righteous people. And he torched the city. He delivered Lot and torched the city. I was talking to a brother before service. The problem with a non-Bible believer is they think too good of people. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You're, we're all dirty rascals. <laughs> Amen. We're all dirty rascals. We're all in it for ourselves. And we got to learn to be in it for others and for God. But you know, a liberal view, you know what the, the world view is? Oh, there's a spark of divinity in everybody, and everybody's inherently good. Yeah, if everybody's inherently good, why are there wars? Six million Jews and, and gypsies and whatnot killed in the Holocaust. That doesn't sound like a world that's inherently good. That's why we need a Savior. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. Now, you have a false teaching. It's a Reformed theology uh, called Calvinism, by John Calvin, that uh, God overrules people's free will to determine his predestined for ordination, uh, for ordained will. And that's just simply not true. Verse uh, number six here, this passage gives a small glimpse, rather, into God's prophecy. That's number six. What God's showing you is he's not showing you that he's going to manipulate someone's free will to bring about his past. He's showing you something that's going to happen in the future. God knows what's going to happen in the future. We don't always know what's going to happen in the future. And what you're seeing here in Scripture is God's giving Moses a glimpse of the mind of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know how to answer everything because I don't have the mind of God. Isaiah chapter 55 says, His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts and our thoughts. And somehow God can see the future before it happens. And I can't. We can't. We're finite. We live in the moment. We can make predictions. I mean, that's what the weather forecast does. And you know how often they can be wrong. But God knows exactly what's going to happen. Not violating our free will. Now, that's a miracle. That's a miracle that only God can do. Even though it may seem that God is manipulating the free will. Now, what confuses the Calvinists is look at Exodus 3.20. Uh, hold on. Nope, that's not what I want. Give me one second here. 
Yup, 420, I think is what I mean. Exodus chapter 4, verse 20. Yeah, 421. I think I got it. Yep. The Lord said to Moses, When thou goest, return to Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. Now that can look like God is going to manipulate free will. But what it's showing you is it's not showing you that he's manipulating free will. He's just revealing what hasn't happened yet. With free will. Now where do we get that from? Well, God gives us a choice whether we harden our hearts or not. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. Harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation. Now, if he's making a command to harden not your hearts, it means that you can have the choice to harden your heart or to not harden your heart. As in the day of provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, what the point is, is God's going to bring about his will or his act, we should say. The Bible says this. In Isaiah, for the Lord shall rise up in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, to bring a pass, bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now, God's going to bring to pass things, but he does it using free will. So, in other words, to sum everything up, God's going to bring to pass what he's going to bring to pass, using you or despite you. <laughs> and because Pharaoh chose to harden his heart, God's going to use him in that way. Look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 20. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. God's going to show the nation of Israel that he's God. He's going to do it through wonders and signs. Verse 21. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. It shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them on upon your sons, upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. So what God's showing is that despite Pharaoh's hardening heart, he's going to bring Israel out with a powerful hand. Any questions this morning? I know I've given a lot of scripture, I've given a lot of stuff to you. God doesn't mess with free will. He uses you with your free will for good or evil. If you want to submit to him, you want to submit your will to his. All right, we'll close with a word of prayer. Take a break. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given to us. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we do pray.